Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Well, hello and welcome to the Psalm 22 episode of our study in the key chapters of God's Word. Today we turn to yet another extremely important psalm in our overall study of the key chapters of the Bible. This psalm, Psalm 22, helps us begin to reckon with the point we discussed yesterday where we said that God's word is the inspired message from him to us. And without passages like Psalm 22, people might hear that and be like, you know what, um, everything you guys are saying, you know, other religions say things. They've got sacred scripture too. They say it's from God. How do you even know that yours is? Well, passages like Psalm 22 are just so prophetic and so accurate. We have to reckon with the fact that they've been inspired by God and given to us from him who is outside of time and knows all events before they even happen. In fact, in order for us to really understand the profound depths of Psalm 22, we need to have the Gospels open to a few key passages. And we're going to see how this psalm so amazingly predicts what's going to happen to our Savior. So let's turn our Bibles also to Matthew chapter 27, Luke 23, and John 19. And I even encourage you to pause this podcast and go find Matthew 27, Luke 23, and John 18 right now. Put a bookmark in each one of them because we're going to go back and forth flipping between Psalm 22 and these passages and just see how they're fulfilled. So I'll give you a second to find those references and then we'll pick things on up. Let's go back to Psalm 22 and let's just start unpacking this incredible and amazing prophecy. For a quick overview, Psalm 22 was written by David. That means this is roughly a thousand years before Jesus. Let that sink in for a minute. A thousand years. Just think about all the changes in our world that's happened in the last thousand years. And here we have a thousand year gap between David writing these words and Jesus fulfilling them a thousand years later. In fact, even with a thousand year gap, David's words reads like a, an eyewitness of the crucifixion, which is even more stunning because when David wrote this, there was no such thing as crucifixion. Uh, David wasn't even describing a common way people were executed in his day or even would die in his day. Not only that, scholars don't find any situation in David's life that mirrors the words he's writing about. It's not as though he's just describing like a really bad day and, oh yeah, it kind of looks like it fits what Jesus went through also. And all of this just shows us that amazingly, God had David write these words as a first person account of incredible suffering and it was suffering that he himself never experienced. So let's dive into this amazing passage. Now we don't have time to go verse by verse. We're just going to highlight the key verses that were fulfilled in Christ's crucifixion. And so, going into verse 1 here, verse 1 starts on out saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if you're familiar with Christ's crucifixion, then you recognize this is what Jesus cried out when he was dying on the cross. Both Matthew and Mark record Jesus saying these exact words. Now, it's often said that these words reflect the agony that Christ felt with the separation from his heavenly Father for the first time in all of eternity. I mean, just think about it. From eternity past, Jesus enjoyed pure, holy, unbroken fellowship with the Lord. Even in the incarnation, he maintained his abiding fellowship with the Father, but not on the cross. And on the cross, rather than abiding in the Father's love, he was abiding in the Father's wrath. And this was the wrath for the sins of his people. This was wrath that was eternal in breadth and depth and experience. And so Christ is obviously crying out just this agony of being on the cross. And yet I believe there's another reason why Jesus cried out these words on the cross. And I believe that was to tell the people or point the people or remind the people of this psalm so that they would go and see the incredible prophecies that it contains. You see, we call this Psalm 22. But that's not how they would have referred to it back then. Uh, the Psalms weren't numbered. They didn't have like just one through 150 like we have today. In fact, they would just, in order to refer to a Psalm, they would just refer to the first line of it. That's how they would say, go to this Psalm. And they just mentioned the first line. People have even did things like that with us in uh, hymns until relatively recently. In fact, it's still pretty common that the first words of a song are often its title. Like Amazing Grace, the first words of Amazing Grace are Amazing Grace. And, and Joy to the World, the first words of Joy to the World are Joy to the world. And so I believe that when Jesus is crying this out on the cross, it's not only because of his suffering and the separation he was experiencing from the Father, but also because he was proclaiming the title of this psalm so that people would connect his death with these incredible prophecies. Well, going on to this passage here, let's talk about some of these things that were fulfilled. Going down to verse 6. Uh, verse 6 says, But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with a the lip. They wag the head saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. 
Now, if this is what the psalmist says, this is what David says a thousand years earlier. Now let's flip over to Matthew chapter 27, verses 39 to 43, and see how the crowds use these very same words, not intended to fulfill these prophecies. They were just saying this stuff because they were so mocking Jesus. And so Matthew 27, verse 39 says, And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple, rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, for he says, I am the Son of God. And here, when you're comparing Psalm 22 to Matthew 27, you're seeing they're, they're referring to the same event. And yet you can see that Matthew's not trying to follow the exact phrasing of Psalm 22. He's just telling us what happened and what happened happened to have fulfilled Psalm 22. In fact, although Psalm 22 is faithfully fulfilled in Christ's crucifixion, it is clear that neither Matthew nor none of the other gospel authors were trying to like massage the accounts that they were giving of Jesus' death to fulfill or reflect this prophecy. Each one has subtle differences where you can see they're not just trying to like take what was written and just say, that's what happened to Jesus. They're just telling what happened. And it is amazing that each one just saying their own vantage point, each a little bit from a different angle, ultimately describe an entire event that fulfills this passage, this prophecy that was written a thousand years earlier. For instance, you see that in Christ's physiological condition as he was nearing death. Let's flip back to Psalm 22, verse 14. Psalm 22, verse 14 says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. Turn to John 19, verse 34. John 19, verse 34 says, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Now, this is a rare event. This is a medical event that happens at certain times, but it only happens when a person is undergoing incredible trauma as they're dying. In fact, David never experienced this. You see, when a person is dying from crucifixion, they're slowly suffocating. Their body starts to crave oxygen, and that causes the heart to start beating faster. But since there is no oxygen because they're suffocating, the tissue of the body starts to get just strained and then damaged, and just fluid starts building on up. And so when Christ was pierced with the spear in John 19, that fluid just starts coming out of that wound. Just an incredible prophecy here that would have made no sense in the life of David. Flipping back to Psalm 22, now down to verse 16. Psalm 22, verse 16 says, For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me, they pierce my hands and feet. Now, we of course know that Jesus was surrounded by Gentiles when he was crucified. They nailed him to the cross. But we take it for granted he was nailed to the cross. But it wasn't automatic that every victim of crucifixion was nailed to the cross. Sometimes they were just tied there. And yet, for some reason, the Romans chose to nail Jesus to the cross that day. Going down to verse 17, it says, I can count all my bones. They look at me and stare. Again, David is describing an experience that doesn't fit anything he's gone through. Yet this is exactly what the son of David experienced. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Again, there's no account of this ever happening to David, and yet this is exactly what the son of David experienced. Turn back over to Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Luke 23, verse 34 says, but Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. What an incredible fulfillment of Psalm 22. Just amazing here. And so as we go back to Psalm 22, you can see the accuracy of this passage is stunning. But then Psalm 22 gives us more than just prophecy of Christ's cross. It also gives us his victory. For instance, verses 19 to 21 speak of a rescue or deliverance from the state of suffering. And then in verse 22, the author declares, David declares, I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you because, the end of verse 24 says, when he cried out to him for help, he heard. And then in verse 25, the author marvels, from you comes my praise in the great assembly. You know, just this incredible praise from God in the assembly of the people. And then down in verse 27, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord all the families of the nations will worship before you. Just this picture again of the nations coming before God. And then I love verse 28, which says, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. And just this incredible confirmation and prophecy that this coming Messiah would die on the cross, but he'd also be a king. And so when we look at Psalm 22 here, it starts with Christ on the cross. It ends with him in glory. It tells us that the one who dies and suffered this way, will also be delivered from death. He will be celebrated by the Lord himself. He will receive a kingdom. And then look at verse 30 and 31. 
it says this message will be told from generation to generation. That's going on in the world today. And then verse 31, they will come and declare his righteousness to people who will be born. Now that's us. Now, in the same way that the gospel writers weren't trying to fulfill these prophecies, we're not trying to fulfill these prophecies, and yet we are fulfilling them ourselves. Every time we declare Christ's sinlessness or that he is king or that we need to be reconciled to him and be saved and enter his kingdom. And so as we reflect upon this incredible psalm and the prophecies it contains, this is a key chapter for so many reasons. First, it's obviously predicting the suffering, atoning death of our Savior. Second, it shows us the inspiration of Scripture. This is something that people will want to ignore, but other religions do not have anything even like this. Google prophecies of other religions. You'll see they have nothing of this kind of detail. The, the detail of this passage is unique to God's Word because these are actually messages from God. And if that's the case we must reckon with the weight of this message. The message is, there is a kingdom that has been established by our Creator. It is a kingdom that is not of this world, not in this world, not part of this world. And yet the king of that kingdom entered into this world and came to redeem people from this world. And he redeemed in a way that caused suffering to himself, but he did that that he might redeem them and pay for their sins so he can bring them to be with him throughout eternity as his brethren. If you are among the people of that kingdom, your task then is to walk in the joy of being redeemed and even to embrace the principles of holiness of that kingdom and proclaim this message to the world around you. And if you're not a part of that kingdom, well, you can be. You can call out to the king right now and seek to be rescued and he will rescue you. And so there's so much great stuff in this psalm. And as we conclude our time together today, if you're a part of Wellington Community Church here in Colorado, and if you were with us on Sunday, or at least kind of viewing the online service, you saw the challenge that we gave to pray at least five minutes a day without asking for anything, this is a psalm that could do that for you. How about going back over this psalm and converting all of these truths back to the Lord's praise? For instance, verse 1, Praise the Lord that He endured this eternal separation from the Father so that you don't have to. Verses 6 to 8, Praise the Lord that he committed himself to the Father and was faithfully trusting the Lord despite the depth of this suffering. Verses 15 to 16. Praise the Lord that in the agony of the cross he continued to seek our salvation as he bore the judgment for our sins. Verse 17 and 18. Praise the Lord he gave such prophecies and fulfilled them so clearly. Verses 19 to 21. Praise the Lord that he was victorious. Verse 22 to 23. Praise the Lord that his people will stand in awe of him. Verse 25, praise the Lord that the Father praises his Son. Verse 27, praise the Lord that his kingdom is going to go to the ends of the earth. Verse 28, praise the Lord that he rules over the nations. Verse 30 to 31, praise the Lord that we are fulfilling these very prophecies even as we proclaim his message to the world around us. Well, you can see there's so much here to celebrate the Lord and praise him for. We'll leave you there with the Lord just to be seeking him, praising him, glorifying him. And I look forward to joining you tomorrow as we go to one of the most famous psalms in the entire Bible, Psalm 23, The Lord is My Shepherd. Until then, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for listening. God bless.